It's time for the Rose Chat Podcast, a podcast dedicated to celebrating the world's most beloved flower, the rose. Join award-winning gardeners Chris Van Cleef and Teresa Byington as they chat with rose lovers and experts from around the globe. With each episode, you'll gain valuable knowledge and insights to achieve the rose garden you've always dreamed of. Listen now as we explore the world of roses. Hey, rose friends. Our good friend Gay Hammond is back today to share some up-to-the-minute information about rose rosette disease. Hey, Gay, welcome back to Rose Chat. Hey, thanks for having me. It's so good to have you. So you've got some new information, and I'm wondering, how did this latest information come about? Well, I'm a member of the organization called the National Clean Plant Network of Roses, and we meet once a year in... And our mission is to be on top of and study um, viruses that impact uh, the rose industry. And this year, uh, it was noted that we needed more evaluators. And I guess I must have been out of the room when I got invited (laughs) to uh, be one of those evaluators. And so since June, I have been assisting the... Center for Invasive Species at the University of Georgia with identifying photographic submissions of roses that are thought to have rose rosette disease. And since between June and September, I've I've looked at about a thousand uh, submissions. And what that taught me, besides the fact that there's way more symptoms of rose rosette than I ever imagined is that there is a tremendous amount of misunderstanding about what is and is not rose rosette. And so the more I found these photos of normal roses that no knowledgeable people were submitting as having rose rosette disease, I said, we have to have a program on this because we need people to understand that just because they see a description in a magazine or a book that says distorted leaves, distorted leaves can come from lots of things, not just rose rosette disease. And so that's why this program is out there is to show people what is and is not, um, Rose Rosette disease, and also to bring forward new information that we didn't know two years ago about this disease and some really fantastic developments that are coming online and have come online as we study this disease uh, more intensively. Well, you know, we don't know a lot or or the average gardener, so... um... I think it's been getting a lot of attention lately in the last few years. And and why is that? Well, it's primarily getting a lot of attention because uh, only in the last 10 or so years has substantive monies uh, in the form of grants Mm -hmm. become available so that we can study it. Mm -hmm. Um, And we can study it on a sustained basis and it at really high levels. And, We know that rose rosette disease is a virus, and we've known that for a long time. But usually when we think of viruses in roses, we think of green leaves with yellow squiggly lines. And rose rosette, which is a virus, does not fit that pattern. (laughs) And and I tell people, uh, and, and I've had some very interesting conversations with industry people over the years, that Variegated foliage in roses is not a good thing, no matter what plant you have to sell. <laughs> uh, it always indicates that there is a presence of a virus. And unfortunately, with rose rosette, you don't have yellow squiggly lines on green leaves with rose rosette. With rose rosette, the virus is different than other viruses. It's deadly and it's contagious. And mm-hmm. so that is our focus And that's why there's becoming so much more attention is because now we're able to study that difference and identify what causes it, what can we do about it, and what are we doing about it. So that is why you're seeing more and more information out there 
uh, in the public arena because what we are learning is being able to be released to the public. Excellent. Now, is this a disease only of roses? I've never heard of it on anything else. It, that is true. It is just a disease of roses. And, and we in the rose industry have always called it rose rosette disease, and it's been called that forever. But science has now given it a new name. Uh, now it is called the Amerivirus rosacea, which mm. means an Amerivirus, which it, rose rosette is one, of roses. And, and that is because there are only nine Ameriviruses in the plant world in the United States, and rose rosette is one of those. So I'm going to have to learn to say a different word. Well, in the in the rose in the rose world, we know what you're talking about. If it's <laughs> RRV, RRV, or rose rosette, uh, mm-hmm. in the scientific world, it's known as something else. So, how does this virus? How does it invade the the rose? Well, <clears throat> interestingly enough, over the years. Uh, there has been a huge speculation of what caused rose rosette. But science now knows it comes primarily from two reasons. One reason is because of a mite, which is a tiny little insect thing. Um, There's two kinds of them. They don't have wings. They don't fly. Uh, And What they do is they feed on a sick rose that has rose rosette disease, and then they get blown, tossed, or a leaf blower gets behind them and moves them from the sick plant to a healthy plant, and they start to feed, and they transfer the virus to the healthy plant, and then it becomes infected. That's the primary method of how roses get rose rosette. The secondary method is it happens as a result of propagation or hybridization Mm -hmm. where we create a new rose from seed and we used a plant that had rose rosette or we take a cutting off of a plant that has rose rosette and we root the cutting and the new plant has rose rosette. Uh, Those are the two primary methods and the science world would say if the primary way one is going to get rose rosette is through the mite then it's best to handle the mite and in handling the mite you handle the disease Mm -hmm. and that makes a lot of sense now what about um um are there conditions that are more likely for this to occur Are there places in the country that are different, or is it the size of the rose, the age, the parentage? Are any of those things known to us? Yes. This is a disease that started off on the eastern side of the United States, and it's traveled Mm -hmm. across the country. And what we see is that a lot of the time it depends on the age of the rose, Mm -hmm. The health of the rose, uh, the environmental conditions of the rose is is the is the is the disease prevalent in the area? Uh, I'll give you a, a, for example in Houston. Uh, Houston is not that far, not that many hour drive from Dallas, but in Houston we don't have the incidence of rose rosette disease like they do in Dallas. Uh, And so what we know is that a rose that is in stress in an area where rose rosette is prevalent, that stressed rose is more likely to get rose rosette than a healthy rose. Mm -hmm. So in, in Houston, when it's 101 degrees, that's when we're going to see symptoms of rose rosette occur. Mm -hmm. Um, Normally it, uh, it shows up, those symptoms show up uh, in the summer, but in places like Houston where it's warm all year round, comparatively speaking, Mm -hmm. 
uh, you can get rose rosette disease symptoms all year long. Up north, typically it's from June to October. Uh, in Houston, uh, I have seen the symptoms start as early as March, and then you stop getting reports around September. So it just depends, but but pretty much it's fair game no matter no matter where the plant is. <laughs> um, I had a new dawn rose for oh probably ten or fifteen years, and then out of the blue. One year it wasn't thriving, and you know, new dawn, you know, it's hard to 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 get it's hard to make it not thrive. And then the next spring, when it sent out new growth, it was RRD looking canes. And of course, that was several years ago, and I didn't know that much about it, but I'm sure that's what it was, even looking back. So it makes me think that it actually had RRD before it showed symptoms. So I'm thinking now that we're learning a bit more, maybe it was already sick and it just wasn't thriving. But then that next spring when it was time to do something, that's when we saw the evidence. And, and we see that a lot. Um, the very first incident in 2015 that happened in Houston, um, Bush came, came, to our attention and it had one stem on the outer canopy that apparently had rose rosette disease. Uh, and the question became, well, how long do we think this plant's been sick? And crawling up underneath this nine foot wide, eight foot tall plant would have never known that this plant had had it for at least a year but for the fact that the witch's broom, which is a symptom, was in the very center of this dense old blush rose, and it had petrified in place. Whoa. And, and it did that because it, the witch's broom got so heavy that it cracked where it was connected to the plant, and it pulled away, and it dried in place. Now, any other time, if it had been on the outside of the plant, it would have fallen off under the bush and turned into leaf litter. But for the fact it was still on the plant from a prior growing season and petrified in place, told us it had had rose rosette for at least a year. But the symptoms didn't come out to the outside of the plant where we could see them until much later. And Mm -hmm. so what we know from from scientific research is that symptoms can show up from infection in as short a time as three weeks and as much as one to two years after Mike carrying Rose Rosette virus infected the plant. So it can happen over a very long period of time, which is why being conscious of the health of your bushes is becomes real important if you live in an area where the disease is a, is a problem. And, and we know that the hotter it gets, the disease incidence will accelerate. Uh, we also know that usually after you start seeing symptoms, the infected plants will start declining like your new dawn did until it eventually dies. Now, science is still working on that subject because we don't know is the plant dying from rose rosette disease Mm -hmm. or is it dying because the, the virus has weakened the plant to the point that a bug or something else came in and actually took it out. So we don't know if it's actually causing the bush to die or it's setting up the circumstance for it to die, to die. But The takeaway is that if you have these big bushy shrubs that are leaves from top to bottom, side to side, and you live in an area where the virus uh, has been known to occur, it's a really good idea to start digging around on the inside of that plant just to make sure that there's nothing in the center of the plant that you can't see that you need to know about. 
goodness. I've got some big bushes out there. <laughs> I know. I've seen pictures of your yard. <laughs> I'm going to have to go do this, some snooping around. Okay, so I haven't had a lot of rose rosette in my garden, but I did have a new dawn. I did have um, a knock, a couple of knockouts, and even a, a Poseidon, a Cordis Poseidon that I'd had for years got sick. So just random through the years, not very often, but occasionally. And I'm wondering, all of those are very different uh, roses. So are uh, symptoms the same for all types of roses or? They're, they're not. And this is where the train gets off the track in uh, a homeowner's garden. People, very well-meaning people, want to learn as much as they can about things that could impact their hobby. And so they read a lot and they see with reference to Rose Rosette, red coloring in association with Rose Rosette or excessive thorns or rubbery stems. I can't tell you how many hundreds of pictures have been submitted because a stem of a rose had two thorns <laughs> on the whole stem. The, the person that submitted that picture thought that two thorns was excessive. Well, mm -hmm. no, because if you look at electron, which is that rose, it's supposed to have a thorn every inch and a half. <laughs> and so the fact that it didn't have enough was, was unique, but it was not excessive. And so it's important when we think of Rose Rosette and we're wondering, is it affecting my bush? You need to know what is normal in your bushes. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be different for however many bushes you have. And I, and I, and people say, well, I don't know if it's excessive in this one and not in this one. Well, the key is to look at the stem that you think is suspicious and compare it to another stem of about the same age on the same plant. Mm -hmm. If those two stems on the same plant are way different, one stem's got hundreds of uh, thorns and the other one's got two. Okay. Maybe you got something going on. Mm -hmm. If you've got round pointed leaves on part of the bush and you've got long willowy strap leaves on the other part of the bush, you might have something going on. Knowing what's normal in your plants is real, real important to correctly identifying whether or not you've got something like rose rosette disease going on. And if you do, it's important to understand that one thing might be interesting, but it may not be indicative of rose rosette. And and for for example, red coloring. People seem to think that just because the growth on a rose is red, that means that rose has got rose rosette. Well, no, it just means the growth is new. But if you've got two or more symptoms that are identifiable to rose rosette, that's when you need to start paying attention to what's going on and in seeing if there's some underlying cause of a bush having a number of symptoms that are similar to rose rosette. And, and I'm not talking about, I would, I would call them uh, de minimis symptoms like puckered leaves, which look like spider mites or red growth. I'm talking about the serious things like witch's broom, mm -hmm. uh, rubbery stems or hundreds of thorns per inch or stem looks like a nettle. I'm, I'm talking about those kind of things that we know Rose Rosette is just about the only cause for that. That's when you need to start paying real close attention and, and maybe being putting on your Sherlock Holmes hat and doing a little bit of double checking. One of the saddest things I've seen people um, ask about are basil breaks. People are afraid of basil breaks because they're going to be a little more rubbery and they're going to be that purple color oftentimes that that's a little scary. Uh, and that's true. And, and 
usually what happens and why it's different uh, with Rose Rosette. Basal breaks only come up from the bottom, and Rose Rosette stems do not come up from the bottom. They are usually found first in the canopy or in the interior. And so if you find those rubbery stems above ground, up in the plant, and you can tie a knot in them and it doesn't break the stem, that's generally rose rosette. Mm -hmm. Or if you're afraid I'm going to break the stem and it might be a good one, push on the thorns. If the thorns feel like when you push them from side to side that they're plastic and they're not coming off no matter what, that is a big signal that maybe mm -hmm. you have rose rosette going on in that stem. It'll just feel like plastic. Absolutely. And you mentioned nettle, the look of nettle, and that is what I saw on my Poseidon. Could you explain that just a little bit? Yes, I, I was raised in the country, so I, I, I know what a nettle plant is. People describe rose rosette symptoms as, as the stems becoming like a nettle. In a rose, we know what rose thorns look like. In a stem that has developed nettle-like symptoms from rose rosette, instead of having those distinctive triangular thorns, this, a rose rosette infective stem sometimes will have, it looks like needles, white needles or red needles. And I've even seen pink needles. And there will be, in one inch, there will literally be a hundred of them or more. And some of them can be an inch long. Some of them can be an eighth of an inch long. But they are solid, side to side. And but for the fact that I'd be afraid I'd rip my skin off, you want to touch them because it looks like fuzz. But it's actually needle-like barbs, and it's just solid. And uh, if we had picture vision, I could show you some wonderful pictures of nettle-like symptoms. Uh, but nothing else is known to cause that but rose rosette. Well, and that is, <clears throat> excuse me, that is so different than a normal rose that it does stand out. Mm -hmm. It's so different, so different. Now you've told us this. And so next I want to know, are there any fixes coming or on the markets or anything that we can do or anything coming soon? Well, that's, that's one of the most exciting things um, that was shared at our National Clean Plant Network conference this year mm -hmm. is we are making headway. Um, I have to say that right now there is no cure for rose rosette disease. I can see the light at the end of the tunnel where that's going to change. Oh, God. Uh, right now, what we can do is prevent it from happening in our gardens by using clean plant stock and destroying infected plants as a course of prevention. So it's real important that we inspect regularly. We catch it when symptoms first happen. We remove the infected plants and that way we reduce the spread and we reduce the impact of the virus if it gets in our garden. But I have to say, we have to make sure it's rose rosette before we do something. I, I get every year, I get calls of people who were told to destroy their rose gardens because they had rose rosette. And then the same symptoms ended up in other plants in their garden, which we know rose rosette doesn't do. And it turned out they had chili thrips. Oh, they had wow. something that was curable, but some well-meaning person told them to destroy all their plants, thinking that they had rose rosette. So we need to make sure that's what it is before we do something. But on the scientific front, the great news is we are finding things that are working, either in plant stock or control agents. The study of the control agents is relatively new. And one of the things that science is working on is when do you use them? There is a very beautiful public rose garden in the United States that it was one of the first ones to jump on the biological control 
robust, and they started using biological controls right after they pruned their bushes. And unfortunately, the mite wasn't there. And when they didn't get Rose Rosette immediately, they thought, okay, we're doing good. And so they quit. And then the mites came, and now they got <laughs> Rose Rosette. And so science is looking at, okay, for what parts of the country, when is the appropriate time to use these biological mm-hmm. control agents? We, the mite needs to be present when we're spraying them or we're, do, we're going to be doing no good. The scientists that, and entomologists that are studying the mites also believe that if the fly population can be reduced to a very low density, there is just a very few chances that a very small number of mites would even transmit the virus. And so the goal is, okay, we may not ever reduce, eliminate all the mites, but we can get the population down to such a point that it is not continuing to spread the disease. And along the mite study work, there are a number of control agents that have prevented rose rosette virus in uh, test plots for five years. There's one group uh, for commercial applicators and then um, for homeowners, products that contain the active ingredient Bifen IT, which is B I F E N, or Bifenthrin, B I F E N T H R I N. Those two products have, uh, for homeowners, have been showing great results in reducing uh, rose rosette virus in the mites that uh, could carry it. So those agents are not contact chemicals. Those are systemic chemicals. Mm -hmm. And so that's one of the problems with trying to treat the mite is they hide in cracks and crevices that sometimes chemical products don't get. So if we can use a um, systemic, we have a better chance of of affecting the mites and, and making them go away. Another good thing on the treatment front is the use of antivirals. Uh, Science knows that one of the things that Rose Rosette does, it reduces the plant's immune system and it impacts how the immune system works. And there is work going on now to look at how do we use an antiviral compound to boost the rose's immune system so that it can help fight itself off. So those are two great things in the control aspect of Rose Rosette that is being worked on. And I have to say, and I'm going to jump on my little soapbox, is if you live in a place where Rose Rosette is common, or you have had it in your garden, send that leaf blower that's in your (laughs) garage to the Goodwill and stop using it. Because on their own, Mites only travel about 50 yards from where they're born on their own speed. But if you crank up a leaf blower behind one, you can blow it to Wasahatchee, Texas from here (laughs) to do damage all the way that it's it's traveling. And so common sense tells us that the use of leaf blowers has facilitated the spread of the disease from one spot to the next. And in Houston, we have a, I point to this complex without using its name, we had an apartment complex that had rose rosette disease in one bush in a hedge of 150 bushes. Brought it to the management company's attention, explained to them about rose rosette and how contagious it was. And so that we wouldn't see it again, they had the landscape men go out and cut it, cut off the witch's broom, and then blow it in a pile, and within three weeks, all the bushes in the complex had rose rosette disease. And so leaf blowers did that. So stop using leaf blowers if, if you have had rose rosette or you it's on your street somewhere because you can make it worse. Now let's talk just a little bit more about misdiagnosis. So what it is, what it isn't. 
I can tell you that in 2019, in a period of three weeks, I got 11 reports. Oh my goodness, I've got Rose Rosette. And in not one case was it Rose Rosette. It was something yeah. else. There are two primary things Rose Rosette gets misdiagnosed. The first is herbicide damage. Herbicide damage can cause witch's broom or what people think is witch's broom. Mm -hmm. And that is usually the number one misdiagnosis. The second one is uh, damage from chili thrips. Chili thrips causes a lot of the same kinds of symptoms that you would see with Rose Rosette. So that's why I say it's always good uh, to get a second opinion um, from someone who knows what Rose Rosette looks like. And just to make sure that what you're working with is, is or is not, because the last thing we want you to do is to destroy a bush thinking it's got Rose Rosette when it had something that was curable. And and we see it misdiagnosed as a lots of things. Chlorosis, which is common in uh, drought conditions or saline or salt content in the water or the soil that causes yellowing of the plants. Yellowing of the plants is a symptom of Rose Rosette. Spider mite damage, mm -hmm. leaves pucker, that's misdiagnosed. So lots of things can be misdiagnosed as Rose Rosette. And, and my goal is that we educate people to, to, to what these differences are so that we really know what we're working with when something is going on with our plants. A side note here, I had never seen chili thrips. Uh, we don't have them here, thank goodness. I'm sure that they're, they'll come someday. They'll love us. But, but right now, they're leaving us alone. But I was in California this fall and, and, and in December as well. And I saw these distorted little stems, and I thought, what in the world is this? It's got to be chili thrips. Looked it up, textbook case, but I'd never seen that before. So I can see a bit how that gets uh, misdiagnosed for sure. And it, and it does, and it, it's the second most common thing I see in all of these evaluations I have done is to me, because I have a lot of experience with chili thrips, it just jumps right out. But I can see, as a layperson, why people would would confuse the two. Mm -hmm. If you're not that familiar with Rose Rosette, you're not that familiar with chili thrips, you would not know the distinctive differences between the two types of symptoms. And so we just want people to, to be treating the right thing. Okay, let's talk a little bit about roses themselves. Are there any roses that uh, you're finding are resistant to Rose Rosette? Well, that's a new development. A um, couple of things have happened in the last two years. We have, um, there have been two genetic markers for Rose Rosette dis resistance identified by Texas A&M and a group of other researchers. And that's a huge deal. Yes. Because yes. now they can look at in a microscope and say, okay, if, if, uh, if this rose, the genetics of this rose has these two markers, chances are the rose is going to be resistant to rose rosette. That's great for hybridizers and breeders because they know what to work with. And that work is going to continue. Uh, there has been for a number of years, some resistant studies testing roses, trying to force them to get rose rosette. <laughs> In April of last year, a rose rosette resistance trial was planted in uh, Bixby, Oklahoma of about 800 plants. And these are 800 plants that appear to be resistant to rose rosette. And so this multi-year trial in the field will ink that, so to speak, to, to, so that we know which, which are and if that resistance holds up. That is great news. We are also looking at other sources of resistance in roses. In other words, we're taking, looking at relatives of roses that appear to be resistant to see if those relatives of the roses that appear to be resistant are also resistant. And, and then the, the goal 
so to speak, is to, once we find all these genetic resistances, is to, to stack them in a plant so that not only is a rose resistant to rose rosette, it can be resistant to black spot and cercospora. And those are the three, I don't know what you would call it, but the, the Marvel characters. Yeah, the big three. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> the, the mega plants. Mm -hmm. uh, it, that would be the goal is to create uh, collections of roses that are resistant at a lot of levels. And in that regard of, of the resistant studies, it's broken down into plants that have had no symptoms of virus and no test for no positive testing for virus for three years in trials in Tennessee and Delaware where Rose Rosette is rampant. Oh, and Tennessee, I know. For on the sure. no symptoms group, the great news is they have identified six species roses, uh, two Rugosa hybrids, which is great for you, but it's not so great for me because they don't live down here. Oh. Uh, and then a couple of modern roses that grow either where you are or where I am, that despite all the exposure and all the temps, they have not had any, any symptoms and no test for virus uh, in three years. And then there's a secondary group that have had few to moderate symptoms in these same trials. And that includes 25 common cultivars that uh, no, go from north to south includes plants like Bright Eyes and Caldwell Pink and Carefree Wonder and, and just a bunch of others that those are promising to have resistant, but those need a bit more study just to make sure that that resistance holds up. So we've got chemical treatments out there that are looking positive as controls for the mites that carry rosers at, and we've got roses that appear to have some level of resistance to rose rosette. And so that tells me I can see the light at the end of the tunnel. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and we can have positive news as opposed to, oh my gosh, I've got rose rosette, the world is over. Yes. Um, speaking of that, I keep thinking of Mark Wyndham, who always says, it's not a grandchild. You know, don't, don't go crazy. It's not a grandchild. You're, we're not asking you to give up a grandchild. You might have to dig up a rose, but there's plenty more. Yeah, that's right. So, <laughs> Mark gets us right to the humor always. Okay, so a few years ago, I remember attending some event, and they told us at that event that Top Gun was resistant to rose rosette. It was a beautiful rose and totally excited. And so um, you're going to tell us that that's not true anymore, but help our listeners to know wh what they read, uh, where, where to find the right information and what to be skeptical of. Well, here's, and, and you're correct. And I think I was at the same. That, we were that, excited. That we were, uh, uh, and you're right. Top Gun is not resistant to Rose Rosette. In by 2017, it had developed Rose Rosette in research trials in both at both the University of Tennessee and the University of Delaware. So, no matter what one reads that has the words "resistant to Rose Rosette," that is not true. And another thing we should remember is think about the source of the information. Right now, there is no cure for Rose Rosette. No matter what somebody tells you that has a product to sell, when that time comes, there will be scientific papers presented that says this product has been shown to cure or, 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 or minimize the mite or this rose is resistant. And that's going to come from credible sources like the universities doing the work, the National Clean Plant Network. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, yeah. It's not going to come from people that have a product they want you to buy. Uh, and so it will come from unbiased third parties who have a vested interest in this research and the ability to share that research with the public. Uh, I promise you, you will see it at the ARS level. Well, 
they will not hide this information. And one of the things that I say to people doing their own research um, uh, on a plethora of things, whatever it is, always check the date, not just the source, but check the date. Because even, even a good source might have said something five years ago that they would not say today. So checking your source and the date of the information is so important. And, and you are so right. Because the groups that I work with on doing research at many different levels, research changes the state of knowledge. Mm -hmm. And so what may have been true five years ago may not be true today. And so you, when, when we do research, we, we want to work from now backwards because now is, is what we need to be working with, not what it was or what we thought it was. 15 years ago, because back 15 years ago was before the grant funds were there that allowed us to do this research and then be able to share it, not only in the scientific community, but in with the public gardeners at large. And so when it comes to Rose Rosette, new information is better information. Yes, the latest information is the best. Okay, Gay, I'm not going to let you go until you walk us through, hold our hands, and help us not to panic. <laughs> well, uh, I like Mark Wyndham's analogy, but I tell people this all the time. If you have Rose Rosette, it's not the end of the world. It may be the end of the bush, but it is <laughs> certainly not the end of your rose gardening career. It is not the end of your garden. Uh, and the important thing is, with knowledge, people are less likely to overreact. Mm -hmm. Overreact is the is the worst thing that I see people doing. Uh, and, and unfortunately, I see it a lot in these chat groups. Oh, my goodness, I've got Rosette tomorrow. I'm going to burn everything. <laughs> that is not the approach to take. First, first of all, we don't know that that person had Rose Rosette to begin with. Mm -hmm. So stay vigilant. Inspect your plants weekly. You know, get a cup of coffee or a glass of wine, go out there and just look around. Mm -hmm. uh, if Rose Rosette is common where you live, uh, be smart with where you get roses. Sometimes that 45 cent rose may not be a good buy. There may be a reason why it's not a good buy. Get your plants from places that have a reputation for knowing what Rose Rosette is so that they're not selling you a plant with it. That's always important. Uh, so that you have, you bring clean stock into your gardens. Uh, you're less likely to get a problem if you're not buying from places you don't know. Uh, and if you, if you think something's going on, ask, ask somebody like me, ask a, a consulting Rosarian in your area or a Rose Society in your area there are people out there around the country that know what this is and know the subtle differences of Rose Rosette. And we're happy to help people diagnose mm -hmm. or direct you to how to find out if that's, if you have Rose Rosette or not and get you to a lab that can identify it from a pathological standpoint. If it's a close call, bottom line is just be ready. If it happens, if, if you live where it happens, uh, just be vigilant and then be ready to jump in with a plan or contact someone that can help you develop a plan on how to deal with it. But it ain't the end of the world. No. Trust me. <laughs> it's not a grandchild. That's right. It's not a grandchild. <laughs> Phew, gay, my head is spinning. I have learned so much and I thought I knew quite a bit. Huge thanks, really, for all the research you do and your willingness to share. Your work really is making a difference, and we appreciate you, Gay. Well, I, I, I appreciate the opportunity to help, and for your listeners, I am happy to. If they've got pictures, that's what I do every morning from 5.30 to 8.30 is look at pictures. Uh, I am happy to look at pictures and, and, and give people guidance on what the next step would be if they need to have a next step. Uh, so I just appreciate you letting me share that, uh, share my passion uh, with, with your listeners. And I look forward to the next opportunity. Well, Rose friends, we'll thank you for joining us for this important chat. 
I hope Rose Rosette is something you never have to deal with, but I also hope you're better armed now with this information to help you not only identify, but deal with it if you do find it. Now, our Spring Fling series starts in March, and Gay will be back for her tips on rose pruning. I think we're calling this show Making Order Out of Chaos. And as I look out at my winter garden, I'm seeing a lot of chaos. So we'll be looking forward to having her back. Well, friends, next time we'll be together. Until then... Happy gardening or happy garden planning. You've been listening to the Rose Chat Podcast with Chris Van Cleve and Teresa Byington, expert rose gardeners who want to help you achieve the rose garden of your dreams. Don't miss an episode. Listen anytime on our website at rosechatpodcast.com or listen on the go via the Rose Chat app on iTunes and Stitcher Radio. Share this podcast with your social networks and join us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram by using the hashtag Rose Chat. Join us next time for another edition of the Rose Chat Podcast. The Rose Chat Podcast is a production of the Rose Chat Media Group, Birmingham, Alabama.